Now we know how we obtain depth values from disparity values, but how, given such a rectified stereo setup, can we actually determine the disparity values in the first place? Well, of course, given the left and the right image, we somehow have to find how much each pixel in the reference image, in the image that we want to compute the disparity map for, let's say this is the left image, sometimes um, also for the right image, a disparity map is desired, but typically um, people start by computing a disparity map for the left image. So for each pixel in left image, we want to determine how, how much the pixel has moved in the right image with respect to the original location in the left image. And the simplest way to do that is to take a little patch around that pixel in the left image and try to find that patch along the epipolar scan line, the epipolar line in the right image. We're trying to find a patch that looks most similar to that first patch. And that's called block matching. But how can we determine if two image points actually correspond to each other? Well, informally, it's kind of clear that they should look similar somewhat to each other, but what does similar actually mean? If we just look at a single pixel RGB color value, that doesn't reveal the local structure. There's too many ambiguities. If there's a red pixel in the left image along the same scan line in the right image, there's too many red pixels or pixels that have color close to red. And that could be confused with that original pixel in particular also because all images are noisy. So the red color, even for the correct location in the right image, would not be would not be exactly the same as observed in the left image. And so you would get a lot of noise if you would just consider a single pixel. And therefore, what we do in practice is we compare a little patch, a little image region that disambiguates these ambiguities better. But even then the task is quite difficult. So if I show you this example here, um, and you look at the tail of this animal, you can see that in these two images, the tail looks quite similar, but then in, in these two images, the tail looks quite different. So even looking at a, a local region doesn't completely solve the problem as we'll also see, but it makes it easier. Now, how does this actually work? I want to show this to you in the context of one very famous scene that has been captured by Daniel Scharstein and Rick Siliski in their famous Middlebury benchmark that has brought a lot of progress in the field of stereo matching has been published in 2003. And uh, this is one of the image images from this benchmark. And the, um, what makes this benchmark particularly interesting is that for every pixel, there has been um, a procedure or there has been a procedure that uh, was able to determine for every pixel the precise disparity ground truth. So for every pixel, we know what the true disparity is. And we can then take our algorithms and evaluate the performance of our algorithms on these image pairs. So here's the right image. This is the left image. You can see that some objects in the front, they move more than objects in the back. You can also see that some objects occlude each other. And you can also see that these objects are pretty Lambertian and also pretty texture rich, which makes correspondence estimation quite easy in this particular lab scene here. Now, how does block matching work? Well, what we do is basically we take a scan line as we have rectified the images. We know that the correspondence for this particular pixel we are interested in the left image at x location x1, this is indicated here by this vertical line, must also lie on that same scan line in the second image. And so what we do is we query all possible patches. Here only a few of them are shown in the second image. And we are trying to measure similarity between these patches. And ideally, we recover this as the correct patch for this query patch here. What you can also see here is that there's a, gr a gray shaded region here on the right. And I have shaded that region because we don't need to search in that region. Remember that the disparity is always positive, but then the search 
is in uh, we have to search in the negative direction so the disparity if we go from the left to the right image then the displacement goes towards the left so disparity zero would be at this white line which is located exactly at the white line here in the first image so this is the x1 coordinate now overlaid over the second image where it is of course at a different it appears differently but it's the same image column and then if the objects would be at infinity then this this part here should be um, actually located here but because they are not they are closer um, we uh, go by some disparity here we move for some pixels in this direction until we have found that patch and that's then at x2 which is the correct location this is what we want to recover so we have only to search in the non-shaded region towards the left of x2, x1 and here at the bottom you can see uh, the matching score for a particular similarity metric that compares these two matches and you can see that in pa this particular example the matching score attains its highest value for the correct location and so if in this case we would just pick the maximum we would get the right match some of them have really low score some of them are higher closer to the maximum but the maximum is clearly distinct from the others this is not true for all patches in particular if there's ambiguities if the patch is textureless etc then this uh, curfew doesn't look as good as it looks here in this illustrative example so how can we actually now compute the similarity metric itself well we consider k by k patches k by k windows in each of these images that are flattened into vectors and we call these vectors wl and wr for a patch in the left and in the right image and flattened means that we just take all the the values of these patches and we concatenate all of them into a, a big vector that's now of size r to the power of k to the power of 2. And what we want to ask ourselves now as well is that patch in the left image the same or very similar to that patch in the right image. And there's a whole variety of evaluation metrics that are used in the community but two very prominent ones for basic block matching are the so-called zero normalized cross correlation cncc and the sum of absolute differences cncc is basically a, a correlation metric that um, takes um, a patch in uh, the left image and normalizes it by subtracting the mean and dividing by its variance and then computing the dot product of this vector with the patch in the right image subtracted by the mean and divided by its variance. You can see here that um, the left patch is taking here the, the arguments denote where we center the patch, where the patch has been extracted from the image. It's taken at x, y and then the right image it's taken at x minus d and y because we move into the negative direction for d disparity levels or for d disparities but we are in both cases extracting the patch at y in the y coordinate so at the same image row this is one metric another metric is the so-called sum of squared differences which is even um, easier to compute so the sum of square differences basically just takes the left patch this is this big vector and then takes the right patch at x minus d and y which is this other big vector from the other image and then subtracts both from each other and computes the um, sum of the squares of the elements of this resulting vector now different metrics have different advantages and disadvantages we don't have time to go into detail and there's numerous other similarity metrics in the literature and if you're more interested in in other some better similarity metrics i recommend to have a look at the siliski book chapter 12.3 or in particular also this pami paper from schaschmuller and scharstein called evaluate evaluation of stereo matching costs on images with radiometric differences that compares a whole variety of different 
matching costs or similarity metrics on uh, uh, in terms of their performance when the objects in the scene are not completely unversion. So what does the block matching the algorithm then look like in total? Well, um, we choose a disparity range. We first need to decide what is the maximum disparity that we want to search for, which determines how close can an object be to the camera. And so we set the disparity range to zero and this maximum D. And then for all pixels in the reference image, let's say this is the left image, we compute the best disparity by using the so-called winner-takes-all strategy, which is we're just computing for all possible disparity levels the similarity score, and we pick the one independently for each pixel. We pick the one that's best. And then we can also do this for the right image as a reference image and search for the correspondences in the left image. And the advantage of having the disparities estimated in the left and in the right image is that we can then check for consistency. As you can see, if we compute disparities in uh, uh, only one of the images, then there's a lot of outliers left. And we can remove these outliers by doing the disparity computation in the left and in the right image. And then they must be consistent. So we can search from the left image, we can go along the disparity, and then we, we have the disparity in the right image. And that must warp us backwards uh, to the first pixel location. And if these don't coincide, then we can say, well, this is probably a wrong estimate and we can remove it. And here on the right, you can see the ground truth, which is very precise and has been estimated by a structured light um, imaging technique for this particular scene. Now, if we inspect these estimated disparity maps, maps a little bit more closely, we can see some artifacts uh, apart from the noise that we also see. One artifact is that there's some regions that appear to be entirely black. And these regions are so-called half occlusions. These are regions that are visible in one image, but not visible in the other image. In particular, they are visible in the reference image, but they are not visible in the target image. And that's why they are called half occlusions, visible only in the reference image. But we don't we can't find a correspondence there because they are not visible in the target image. For example, here on the very left of the reference image, if we move, if we look at the scene from the right uh, image perspective or right camera's perspective, then these pixels here will move outside of the image domain. You can see that this cone has disappeared. The first thing we see is this cone here. And that's why here we can't estimate disparity. Similarly, if we have an object inside, uh, the scene, like this part of the mask here, let's say, and there is another object in front like this cone that's occluding this mask in the right image, then for these pixels on that mask, of course, we can't find a correspondence and so we can't estimate disparity for, that, for those. Here's an illustration of this half occlusion. Let's say we have these two objects, the background object and the foreground object, and then there is this red area that's visible in the left camera image, but it's not visible in the right image because this object is occluding this uh, portion of the scene. Now let's talk a little bit in more detail about the assumptions of block matching, the assumptions that block matching makes that in practice are often violated and that's why more sophisticated algorithms are often used. One assumption, um, one of the most important assumptions that block matching makes is that all the pixels inside that region that we consider for block matching are actually displaced by the same disparity. So let's assume we use this patch size for block matching for comparing patches and we compare two patches pixel by pixel using um, zero normalized cross correlation or sum of square differences, then we assume that all the pixels inside that patch are displaced by disparity D into the other image. However, this assumption is often violated. It's, this is called the front operable assumption. This assumption actually holds only true, if you think about it, it holds only true for 
uh, planes for 3D planes in the scene that are coplanar with the image plane. That's why it's called a frontal parallel assumption. It only holds true for all the planes that are parallel with the image plane, like a wall that you're facing straight. It doesn't hold true in particular for slanted surfaces. So here we have a, a surface on this vehicle that is uh, violating this assumption because it's it's entirely non-frontal parallel. It's slanted inwards. Um, the wall is to the right, in other words. And this surface, or this the content of the surface, deforms perspectively. That's what we know. If this would be a plane, it, based on perspective projection, it pers uh, deforms perspect uh, perspectively and not via simple translation when the viewpoint changes. And it's illustrated here. So I have zoomed into that patch. This is what we have here. And then if I look at the same patch in the other image and I toggle back and forth, you can see that the size of the structures has changed, that the content of that patch has been squeezed. And that means that the assumption of every pixel inside the patch moving in the same way just by translating based on the disparity is violated. Similarly, we have a similar effect for occlusions or at disparity discontinuities. So here we have a patch and we want to uh, predict the disparity for the center location of that patch, which is on this stick that's in front of this background. Um, and you can see the zoom in here. And obviously, if I now move the camera, the foreground stick moves differently from the background cloth. And uh, therefore, the content of the patch that we are comparing, this is the first patch, this is the second patch, changes completely. And again, this is a violation of this assumption that all the pixels are moving the same way. So you can already see there's a trade-off between choosing large patches and small patches. And that's illustrated here. On the left is a disparity estimate of a stereo algorithm of a block matching algorithm using a window size five by five pixels. And on the right, you have a result with a window size of 11 by 11 pixels. And what we can see here clearly is that small windows on the left here lead to matching ambiguities and therefore add noise to disparity maps. But larger windows, which lead to smoother results, also lead to a loss of detail. So we have a less accurate, less precisely estimated boundaries of the individual objects because we are violating the frontal parallel assumption too much. So on the left, we have uh, too many ambiguities. On the right, we have less ambiguities, but we're violating this frontal parallel assumption. And so this also leads to border bleeding effects um, that you can see here, where the, if, if I toggle backward and forward, you can see that the disparity map, the disparity, the, the boundary of this foreground object with respect to the background object is not precisely aligned with the boundary of the object, with the actual boundary of the object, which we can clearly see because we can understand the scene. So this boundary is here where the cone ends and here at this, uh, in this example here as well. So we get this bleeding artifact where foreground objects are bleeding into the background. The disparity of foreground objects bleeds into the background. Here at this pixel, for instance, where the disparity should be the disparity of the background object, we actually observe or estimate the disparity of the foreground object. That's called border bleeding. And that happens if the windows are too large and because of the violation of this frontal parallel assumption. And uh, just to give a little bit more intuition, um, why this happens, uh, if we look at this, um, this is uh, for, for this particular region here, if we look at a little patch in this region, and we want to uh, determine um, the uh, disparity for a point on the edge. That's easy because the edge is the dominant structure. And so if we are on the edge, we can estimate the um, disparity precisely because that's dominating the matching cost. But unfortunately, it's also dominating for this patch here where we want to estimate the disparity for this point. 
but the background changes only slightly while this foreground edge is really dominant and so despite this pixel location for which we want to compute disparity being located on the background um, there's a lot of information here from this edge and so eventually this is outruling the background the background is not providing enough gradient information not enough texture and so this pixel gets assigned the disparity of that edge which is the disparity of the foreground object and that's incorrect now we can alleviate some of these effects and also remove some of the outliers by performing a so-called left-right consistency test. Now this is a result for a different, a better stereo matching algorithm, but it illustrates the principle. Outliers and half occlusions can be detected by computing a disparity map for both the left and the right image as a reference image, and then verify if they map to each other, if there is a cycle. So we, we for every pixel in the left image, we look at the disparity and move along that disparity uh, in the right image and then we query the disparity at that, at, at that location and then we, we move along that disparity backwards in the first image and then that point that we end with should be the same as the pixel location that we have started with and if that's not true then there's likely then there's an inconsistency and it's likely that in one of the disparity estimates, there's an error, and so we can reject that point. And that happens, for instance, for occlusions, because in occlusions, it's very likely that the disparity is inconsistent because in the reference image where the occlusion happens or the half occlusion happens, we are almost assigning a random value here. And so that value will with almost probability one be not the same as, or not corresponding to the value in, in the other image. Uh, as a reference image. And so you can see here that it's relatively easy to actually detect these occluded regions using such a simple and also fast to compute cycle consistency or left-right consistency test.